Welcome to Capitol Beat. It's week two, and the, le the legislature this week focused mostly on Act 46, the education reform bill passed last year. And joining us to talk about the spending thresholds and how to deal with them this year is Representative Dave Sharp. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're the, uh, the chairman of the House Education Committee, and you are now looking at ways to deal with the spending thresholds put in place last year that many school districts have bumped up against. Um, give us just a brief overview of d the direction that you've set the House on. So we s started hearing over the summer uh, some of the difficulties school districts were having staying under the 2% right. variable threshold. So there were school districts that had as as little as zero percent mm -hmm. uh, possible growth in their per pupil costs, right. and um, and w then we started hearing about uh, the unexpectedly high increases in healthcare premiums at seven point nine percent. So there was uh, sympathy in the committee for uh, softening or tweaking uh, the the uh, thresholds. So we felt that it was very important to continue to keep the pressure on. Uh, uh, cost containment mm -hmm. um, as we move from uh, our insulated uh, tiny school districts to Act 46 larger integrated school districts um, and uh, so that it was important to keep those thresholds in place. On the other hand, uh, listening to the concerns that uh, school districts had and trying mm -hmm. to stay under the thresholds. Yeah. And um, how many school districts are going to be affected by this uh, proposed spending threshold increase that your, your, your committee approved? Well, they, they all are. Sure. Um, oh. And the, the agency has estimated that under the current thresholds, uh, just under half of the school districts would not be able to stay under them and would exceed them. Sure. And with the change, how, how is that? Is there, how, how many fewer? Do we have any idea? So, somewhat fewer would not stay under. It would be less of a penalty for everybody that uh, is over the threshold. So it helps. It, it, they estimated around 127. Mm -hmm. It would help every one of those school districts' uh, penalties either uh, go away or be less. Uh, Senate education is looking to repeal them altogether. Um, so how do you see these two um, disparate propositions um, reconciling themselves here? Well, it's not going to be easy, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we do feel strongly in the House. It's why the thresholds were in the bill in the first place and why uh, we recommended a 0.9% increase in the threshold, yet keeping them in place, mm -hmm. is that uh, we feel that it's important to keep the pressure on with regard to cost containment. Mm -hmm. Do you see any wiggle room in the House in terms of the your position and then the Senate position because it seems the the House Ways and Means Committee felt a little differently at least didn't feel as strongly about boosting the the threshold by 0 0.9 percent. Yeah, uh, there's a wide uh, spectrum of of opinions mm -hmm. and and uh, we see it across the spectrum in the state in the public and mm -hmm. we see it across the spectrum here in the House. And uh, you were with the speaker before you joined us here on this program. Any, uh, any idea where the speaker stands at this point? He supports our work in the committee uh, okay. and, and supports the point nine. Mm -hmm. um, but the real question is how do we move forward from here knowing that the House is on a different track than right. the Senate? Mm -hmm. So there will be a lot of back and forth with your Senate colleagues to, to figure this one out? Absolutely. I, I mean, the, the uh, the longer it hangs on and the more, the less clear we can be with school districts, mm -hmm. the more problematic it is. And um, we understand that. It's why we've uh, worked diligently since day one. Actually, we've been working since November. We, we had a committee meeting in November in an effort to uh, bring uh, clarity to this in a timely manner. Right. If, if the Senate ref refuses to compromise, would you be willing to just leave the thresholds intact as, as they are? Is that going to be your, your alternative? Well, I think doing nothing is, uh, is clearly a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we can't reach some agreement between the House and the Senate, the result is uh, that the thresholds in Act 46 stay in place. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Representative Sharp, thanks so much for joining us Thank today. You. We appreciate it. Glad to be here. And we're back with Bennington County Senator Brian Campion, a member of the Senate Education Committee. Thank you. Oh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. 
Uh, we just spoke with uh, Dave Sharp mm -hmm. from the House Education Committee, and we talked a little bit about the House position on Act 46 mm -hmm. and the spending thresholds. Their idea is to boost the cap 0.9% mm -hmm. to help districts uh, who are struggling under the, those thresholds. Mm -hmm. The Senate has moved forward with a different plan Correct. to strip out the thresholds altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Why are you looking to eliminate them? So the testimony that we, we heard over the past uh, couple of weeks really to me and I think to the other f three members of the uh, Senate Ed Committee that joined me on this decision really felt as though this was impacting kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, we tell school districts, we tell teachers, we tell principals, you have to uh, do pre-K, you have to do dual enrollment. These are things that cost money. Mm -hmm. Health care costs, we all know, are up. Right. So these are putting pressures on budgets. And what we heard from folks, in order to meet the requirements Act 46 put in place last year, they were going to start cutting things such as remedial math, yeah. counselors, uh, school safety initiatives. And we felt as though that was just really bad policy. Act 46 talks about primarily expanding mm -hmm. opportunities. And this would be, in my opinion, taking away opportunities. And it's interesting. Next week, we will have CCV and the state colleges come into our committee, as we do every year. And an annual question is, how many of our Vermont students do you need to remediate? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the past, that percentage has been somewhat high. I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's always a surprisingly high number. So to me, how can we be asking people to cut courses right. and then at the same time become angry that certain things aren't being fulfilled in our public schools? Yeah. So, so that's where a lot of us fell on that issue. The, the, the spending thresholds, mm -hmm. we, we refer to them as caps and people get right, right. angry about that, mm -hmm. but uh, the spending thresholds uh, were to some extent intended to help keep property taxes down mm -hmm. and force districts to think long and hard about what they are putting in their budgets. Mm -hmm. um, by removing them altogether, aren't you eliminating that property tax relief that uh, you were that, well, you know, hoping to hoping achieve? for yeah. some. I, I think there are two pieces of 46. And I think, again, just speaking for myself, the overarching priority for me was to expand opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully some tax relief will come from that. I still believe Act 46, because of a new governance structure, right. will lead eventually to some savings. It's possible that savings may be reinvested into schools. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that we'll see what happens. But um, without a doubt, there are people who are feeling tax pressures. We have to address those. But we also have to, I believe, trust the taxpayers, trust the citizens, trust the educators to do what they need to do to really educate young people to be active participants in this democracy as well as um, prepare them for the workforce. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this state historically, again, in general, 95% of the school budgets are passed every year. Right. Let's trust people to continue to do the right thing. I really don't think, if we were looking at hospitals, if we were looking at something where we were telling hospital personnel, physicians, nurses, that you cannot run a certain test, mm -hmm. you cannot provide a certain service to a young person or anyone to make that individual healthier, it, this wouldn't be happening. I mean, this, this is really, I think, um, something where we need to give, like we give hospitals and medical professionals flexibility to do right by young people in Vermont. And I think teachers, educators, taxpayers deserve that. And as you guys will, will as you, you'll recall, uh, the Senate version of Act 46 never included the caps. The right. caps were put in at the very last minute, and um, I think it, it was a mistake. So we're, we're rapidly moving toward what appears to be another showdown, I suppose, between House and Senate, mm -hmm. and that the House is looking to increase the thresholds by 0.9%. Right. Um, if you can't reach compromise, is leaving the thresholds in place the alternative? I think we're going to try to reach some kind of compromise. Just prior to walking in here, uh, the chair of Senate Ed indicated that she's having conversations with folks. Um, so again, I think we don't want this to be political. We want this to be what's best for kids. So I personally want to get somewhere so that we can, can do that. What is the worst possible outcome in your view? Both, both House and Senate 
dig in their heels and do and nothing the, and, and the, do and nothing in the cap status stay. quo yeah, stays. This yeah. isn't this isn't this shouldn't be a power game and it won't be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think historically again, uh, the Vermont legislature um, really thinks about its citizens and puts its citizens first. What's the uh, what's the track for your bill that you're working on now? When will it hit the Senate floor? Uh, I believe it'll be put on notice on uh, Tuesday, so I suspect it'll hit the Senate floor by Wednesday. Okay. Uh, and I think, I may be wrong, but I think we have the votes to, to lift the caps. Um, and I know that uh, it's interesting reading the, the press and hearing from other folks. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a maybe disconnect in the House around how people feel about you know, right. what, what House Ed did versus what some people I think are perhaps might be in uh, more agreement to what Senate Ed did. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That is you know, a very internal uh, situation. All right. Senator Campion, thank you so much for being here. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Brian, thank thanks. You. Yeah, thanks. We're joined now by Dorset Republican Representative Patty Comline. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, as this uh, Act 46 discussion over the, the threshold spending continues, you have an amendment that you are looking to add on to some education bill uh, that would limit the hit on the education fund. Right. It would be an education mandate amendment that people are familiar with now in the House right. because I've attached it to many bills over the past year and a half. What it would call for is any bills that we pass here mm -hmm. that cost money to schools that right. we pay for out of the general, state's general fund. If it's a good idea, we should be paying for it. You know, Pre-K is a good idea, but that's mm -hmm. put a lot of pressure on the local schools. Right. Uh, there's a number of dual enrollment. There's a number of things that we've done over the years that have driven up school costs. So I thought it was appropriate to put this bill on this put this amendment on right. this bill when we're talking about thresholds and we're slamming schools, punishing them for going over mm -hmm. a certain threshold while we're passing bills here that drive up costs. So now, would this be retroactive or would this no, be for new I couldn't, I couldn't for new get mandates? A, I would happen. like to do retroactive. I couldn't get that agreement. Mm -hmm. So it would be going forward. Mm -hmm. It's passed the House three times and it never gets by the Senate. Right. So I'm counting on this year really getting it done early getting it over there and having people contact their senators mm -hmm. and ask them to support this because it just makes sense. Has the Senate taken it up for a vote? They have not. Um, they have it in the past. They've taken it out of bills. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really want the public being aware yeah. of this and hopefully pressuring senators into supporting it. And again, it's going right. forward. Um, it can't. I plan on putting it on the, this threshold bill that mm -hmm. you hear a lot of talk about now. Um, and I'm just told it would be considered non-germane because the bill is very tightly word, mm -hmm. worded so it can't have many amendments and that the speaker wouldn't give right. me any um, assurance that it would be taken up. So it will be going on the next education bill we have that's relevant. Do you know yet uh, what that next education bill will contain? I, it should be what we call the yield bill. It used to okay. be the property tax mm -hmm. rate bill that we set. Right. Now the new language is a yield. So yeah. that will be the next bill out. And will be coming out of my committee. They asked right. me to do, do this on the floor of the House rather than in committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, it was passed almost unanimously, I think three times now. Right. Um, but I'm excited that we can get it moving early and then I'll be working on a lot of out constituent outreach for people to contact okay. their senators and get it passed. You mentioned the, the pre-K program that was passed by the legislature, the dual enrollment program. Um, are there any other mandates that have been passed in recent years uh, and fed into the education fund? Yes. Uh, there was a recent one called Act 66, I think, that I was just told about by the State uh, Board of um, Superintendents. Uh, and what that had to do with was individual education plans for each uh -huh. student. There was one we did, which was, none of these are bad bills. A right. lot of them are laudable. There was a concussion bill we passed, mm -hmm. and that evidently cost, uh, cost the school $750,000. So these have effects. Right. There's one that I bring up, it's, it's minute, but it was called green cleaning products. Uh -huh. that we mandated that all schools have to use green cleaning products. And I went to buy laundry detergent, and I went to get my six ninety nine laundry detergent, and next to it was the green clean the green right. and it was $25 wow. so there there's an impact to all of these things that we yeah. pass and they're laudable and they're well-meaning but we should be paying for them now not pushing on the school do we know what the impact has been on the statewide property tax rate over the last few years because of these no I wonder if I could get that that's a good question I'm not sure I could get I, I have a packet of right. bills that were passed over the last 10 years though, and it's substantial how many bills we've passed that yeah. have financially impacted the schools I don't know if I can get a total note on that right. but I'll try. It seems the public might think differently about these sorts of mandates if they knew what the impact 
individual impact from each piece of legislation oh, yeah. and, and there, was on the their The pre-K was at least $20 million. I mean, they're significant. These yeah. are significant bills. How's the outreach going with the Senate on this uh, amendment so far? I haven't tried yet. I want to get it passed here first. Once it gets <laughs> over there, then we're going to work. I'll be having people contact my senators for sure yeah. right away, uh, the school, especially focused at the school board level, and then we can branch out from there because the school boards will have vested interest in this as well. Right. All right, Patty, thanks okay. so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Education obviously wasn't the only thing happening here in the State House this past week. Uh, Josh, we had a privacy bill in the Senate and more action on marijuana legislation. Um, the, the privacy bill is fairly interesting, and it was the first piece of legislation that the, the Senate took up as a, as a body. Absolutely, yeah, and it gave it a ringing unanimous endorsement. Um, so, uh, Which is interesting, because that almost never happened. That almost, yeah, you're right. I um, was, except I was, for those concurrent resolutions, you know. Yeah thanking Bob the Builder for uh, doing something great. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty rare that I've seen the Senate in complete agreement on, on anything, yeah. but this was the case. Um, so this privacy bill, uh, the intent of it is, according to the lawmakers, which uh, Senator Joe Benning out of Caledonia and yep. Senator Tim Ash and Senator Dick Sears are the co-sponsors on this bill. And what they're saying is that this is an attempt to make legislation catch up with advances in technology. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, most of it regards um, the way that law enforcement is able to use technology to gather in information on people. Um, so it touches on uh, um, unmanned aerial devices or drones. It touches on the way police can access your cell phone records or email records. Yeah. It, it touches on uh, the data that's collected by license plate readers. Mm -hmm. And so it places limits on what police are able to do. For example, if they want to use a drone to conduct uh, surveillance of your residence, then they right. have to get a warrant for that yeah. um, as opposed to just flying around. Yeah. Um, it also, ex there are exceptions to that. If you had, if they have what they perceive to be an emergency situation, mm -hmm. I suppose if you had maybe a search and rescue, then I suppose yes, that would, that would right. probably be perfectly fine. But um, if they're looking specifically to gather information on a person, then they need to have a warrant. Um, they also need a warrant if they're going to access um, a lot of your elect electronic communications, uh, say text messages, uh, say emails, uh, the contents in both the subject lines. Mm -hmm. Those need warrants. Um, they have a lower standard or threshold for what they call subscriber information. So that is your IP address. Um, it's that more of that metadata that. Yeah. We've heard so much about through the NSA yeah. stuff. And the, the argument that um, that law enforcement made before the Senate Judiciary is, well, you don't need a warrant to know somebody's physical address. Mm -hmm. So they shouldn't need a warrant to know somebody's virtual address. And apparently that argument held water with the Senate Judiciary mm -hmm. because they ended up going in that, that direction. Interesting. Um, so yeah, this bill came through really uh, smooth. And uh, we expect it'll probably be over in the House, I imagine, fairly soon. And we should note that the, uh, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee began reviewing this over the fall. Absolutely. So they wanted to get a jump start on it. And uh, isn't there a new a new crime for arming a drone? Yes, I yes, thought yes. that was one of the more fascinating yes, things Yes, this, this is true. Uh, one of the few aspects of this bill that doesn't actually relate explicitly to law enforcement yeah. has to do with, uh, it makes it a misdemeanor crime uh, punishable up to one year in prison mm -hmm. for mounting a weapon or firing a projectile from a drone. Does a potato gun count? I think anything that can be fired, I think, would probably <laughs> fall balls? under this. I, you know, is that a misdemeanor crime? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So that bill, uh, I believe, was getting third reading on Friday, mm -hmm. um, and we'll head over to the uh, the House for its consideration. Now we mentioned that the the Senate Judiciary Committee took this up early in the fall mm -hmm. during the off session because they wanted to. Uh, get this out in the first week, first couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and that's because they were trying to focus now on the marijuana bills. Um, mm -hmm. There are two under consideration. We've heard some testimony already uh, for and against legalizing mm -hmm. marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, you sat through a hearing earlier this week uh, with Bennington Police Chief Paul Doucette, mm -hmm. who is the is the chairman of the police hey. chiefs. I would have to look. I, yeah. I, I believe he has a title like that. I, yeah, I, Fair I, enough. I believe he's something like president or executive um, director or something of yeah. like the police chiefs of, of Vermont. Right. Yes. So he had some interesting testimony and was very much against legalization. Absolutely. Uh, he was part of a contingent of law enforcement folks that headed out to Colorado right about one year ago. Right. 
um, when we were first talking about pot, that was when the Rand Commission study came, mm -hmm. came out. Um, so he and some state police and uh, some sheriffs and some state state's attorneys took the trip out to Colorado, and mm -hmm. uh, the information that they came back with was pretty uh, damning, at least from their perspective. Yeah. And so they are strongly urging against any sort of legalization. Yeah. Um, Stephen Bernard, who's the uh, sheriff for Rutland County, mm -hmm. um, said that uh, all of the sheriffs in the state are united against uh, legal legalization. Right. Uh, sh uh, Chief Chief Desette said that uh, marijuana is the first step toward heroin addiction. Um, Although he didn't call it a gateway drug, but alluded yeah, to he, that. He said, so he said, I'm not going to call it a gateway drug, but it is the first step. Right. Um, uh, Senator Tim Ash pointed out that we currently have a heroin epidemic in Vermont, and we don't have legal marijuana, so maybe that's not the, maybe that's not a straight line. Um, <laughs> however, uh, the police chief is standing by that yeah. uh, statement. Okay. On Thursday, uh, Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, Commissioner Susan Donegan offered some what I thought was interesting testimony mm -hmm. regarding the banking system in the insurance industry sure. and how, what's the, uh, uh, what's the uh, problem with that Wait. so there, there's a couple of issues number one uh, the federal government still considers marijuana to be illegal mm -hmm. and uh, accessing banking services through the federal banking system would be uh, near impossible for, for retailers mm -hmm. or uh, lounges, which are part of the, the legislation. They would be allowed if it's passed. Mm -hmm. um, the, in Colorado, where it is legal, uh, businesses have had difficulty finding access to banking services because mm -hmm. any bank with a federal charter does not want to accept their business. Um, they're afraid that they will lose their relationships with the Federal Reserve. Um, so credit unions have begun to, to spring up. Mm -hmm. um, many of them have state charters. Uh, in Vermont, we have at least one medical marijuana dispensary that does business banking services with the Vermont State Employees Credit Union. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's simply cash or check. They have no access to debit cards mm -hmm. or credit cards because that uses the federal banking system. Mm -hmm. um, many insurers don't want to insure a marijuana-related business because they're not quite certain what their liability is because, mm -hmm. again, the federal government doesn't uh, consider marijuana to be legal. So if a legal market is set up, uh, perhaps there is opportunity for other credit unions to offer basic banking services, at least uh, a place to deposit cash mm -hmm. and write checks from the account. Um, but it could be very difficult for, I think there's 84 retail outlets that would be allowed in Vermont under one of the bills and 42 lounges. Um, that's a lot of businesses that would need access to banking service and uh, they may not find willing participants. So mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that Commissioner Donegan did say is you don't want unmarked vans you know, driving around the highways with piles of cash in them because they have nowhere to put it. Um, so that's something that uh, the, the state will have to figure out moving forward, how to accept uh, money made from a legal marijuana market in Vermont when it can't be deposited into a traditional bank. So, And so well, we, we had current law enforcement uh, testify uh, against legalization. A former uh, top chief here yes. at law enforcement here in Vermont came out in favor of it. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, Kimberly Cheney, a former AG, he served from, I think, 73 to 75. Mm -hmm. uh, he came out in favor of it and said he'll be urging uh, lawmakers to act this year. And really the, the big reason that he is pushing legalization and that many others uh, are doing so is because they believe prohibition has failed. Um, and plenty of people still have access to marijuana, still use marijuana. Um, and, uh, you know, we might as well try something different and capture uh, and regulate the market rather than cede it to illicit drug dealers. So um, that's at least one former law enforcement official that is now in favor of legalization. And perhaps we'll see more moving moving forward. All right. Joining us now is Chittenden County Senator Dave Zuckerman, a Thank you. candidate for lieutenant governor. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. We, uh, we are here to talk to you a little bit about a legalization bill, marijuana legalization bill sure. that you introduced last year. Uh, there's a new bill this year. That's right. Um, first of all, run us, just give us a brief recap of your bill and how it differs from what's on the table this year. Well, I think sort of everything's on the table. Mm -hmm. And that's the process we go through is discussing the different elements of both bills that are introduced as well as issues that other folks are bringing up. And I think there are yet more to talk about. Yeah. But uh, both bills have uh, discussions around basically 
regulating what is now an illicit underground market. It's as I think maybe you're, you've been talking about in the past, uh, clearly prohibition has not worked to eradicate cannabis. No one is saying that cannabis is a wonderful thing to use, just as no one says that alcohol is a perfect thing or tobacco is a perfect thing. The question is, what's the best way to manage it in our society? And I think many folks have come to a rational conclusion that managing it in a regulated environment means knowing the concentration of product that people are getting, knowing that folks aren't getting it from uh, a, quote, drug dealer who may have other interests in getting you hooked on something else. Uh, so the two bills and the discussion in, uh, from the RAND report mm -hmm. discuss everything from how to tax it yeah. to how to manage it, how many stores can sell it, uh, whether there's a licensing program for production mm -hmm. and for uh, production from a cultivation perspective right. as well right. as uh, different folks who might process it into different ways of consuming it. I think a big piece of the discussion that folks are concerned about, frankly, when I hear about concerns, there's basically three primary concerns. Access for youth, mm -hmm. edibles, and then sort of driving and or workplace concerns for people right. who are uh, consuming the product. And, the, and those were all conditions that Governor Peter Shumlin mm -hmm. laid out That's when right. he came out and said, I will sign a bill if it takes those things under That's right, and actually during that speech, I was pretty pleased because four out of the five of those were in the bill that I introduced <laughs> right. in mm -hmm. some form or another. And yeah. as people who follow the legislative process, everything is always addressed, and then how do you address it yeah. uh, often? So uh, the one that, that I had a difference in my bill with what he said was with respect to edibles, mm -hmm. and frankly, I'm open to that discussion. The bill I introduced said no edibles that look like children's candy, mm -hmm. no edibles, uh, or all edibles have to be wrapped in single serving units, right. uh, and then also uh, any edible that's produced would have to be approved by a board. Mm -hmm. And there are problems with that from a um, sort of procedural scenario, uh, but at the same time, fully banning them also just means, okay, the edible market will be the next underground market that we're not right. regulating. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's something I'm more than happy to talk about, and if, if you know, passage of the bill, everything else is working mm -hmm. or generally approved, and that's the one sticking point, you know, edibles can be put off a few years. That's right. not the crux and necessary mm -hmm. element, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, it's generally believed that there's a few weeks for the Senate to deal with this mm -hmm. um, and pass it and move it on over to the House if it is to move forward this year and become law. Do you, uh, how are you feeling at this point in terms of its prospects? Well, there's an interesting dynamic of what the timeline is. Right. I think the President Pro Tem had said three weeks, but I think that was really about don't have any one committee take more than you know three weeks worth uh -huh. of time because there's other issues to take up. Right. So whether the bill moves out of the Senate within three weeks, I don't think that's either a realistic timeline nor yeah. a realistic um, you know drop dead time. Right. Uh, you know, for it to pass through the House, I do think there's uh, legitimacy to making sure we get a very thoroughly vetted bill mm -hmm. that really covers many of these issues that have been brought up, which are legitimate issues with, I think, reasonable ways to yeah. address them. Uh, but it's got to be a very comprehensive and well done bill mm -hmm. for it to get through the House where they have not spent as much time as my Senate colleagues have. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, we have talked about cannabis reform in various formats for over 10 years now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of constituents are ready and typically legislators aren't ready to pass something until they feel like their constituents are. And that work has evolved for a long time mm -hmm. and I think there's a, certainly still a good possibility for it to get through. Okay. Um, if you were if you were a betting man, would you would you bet on legal marijuana this year? Um, I probably would, but I think it's just <laughs> over 50-50. It's not a, it's not certainly a slam dunk by any means. Better than the Powerball, which apparently nobody ever bought one. So which is too bad. I, yeah. I, was, I never buy them. I went by my corner <laughs> store and they were actually closed for the evening. So <laughs> I wasn't right. in the running, but you I probably saved, saved, saved some your money. Two bucks. That's yeah. right. All right, Senator Zuckerman, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thanks again for joining Capital Beat. Yeah, we will you. be back next week with a wrap-up of week three here in the legislature.